Hello and welcome to another TLDR UK video. Now, we might have made a couple of other videos on the potential for a deal between the UK and Australia, as well as discussing the other deals the UK has reached since Brexit. But this deal really is very, very important. Why? Well, the UK and Australia have a long connection. The country was colonised by Britain in the 1700s and has been part of the British Empire or Commonwealth ever since. The two also do a decent amount of trade, and while not the biggest trading partners, annual trade between the two is worth an estimated £13.9 billion, so a trade deal to try and facilitate this is always going to be eye-catching. Add to that, many see Australia as the key to unlocking a wider deal within the whole region, as we discussed in this video linked below. More than just this deal, or Australia though, this is the first brand new deal the UK has struck since Brexit. All of the others they've secured thus far have been reworkings or rollovers of old EU deals. We already had deals with these countries prior to leaving the EU, but that's not true for the UK-Australia deal. The EU doesn't currently have a deal with Australia, although they are working on it. And as such, this is a brand new deal. The first new deal. That's a big thing, because Brexit was often justified because of these deals. We were promised that by leaving, Britain could find new, better deals with other countries. And this is the first time that's happening. It's more than just that, though. This deal sets a precedent. As the first fresh deal, it shows other countries what they can expect, and what Britain's willing to trade away. In fact, Canada have even said that they expect to receive a similar offer to the Australian deal, so we can expect to see versions of this deal cropping up around the world. So if this is such an important deal, one that might be replicated, we ought to find out what's included. I mean, we've hyped up this deal's importance a lot, but is it even a good deal? So in this video, we're going to explain the UK's first deal with Australia and the major controversy surrounding it. Before we do, though, we've got to pay the bills. You probably know that we have a book called Brexit, the colouring book, and the brand new third edition takes you through the whole story in 25 images, from the calling of the referendum to Johnson signing the EU deal. Even if you're not into colouring, it's a cool memento of the process and picking it up obviously helps us out. You can get 25% off right now by using code AUSTRALIA. The link is in the description. First things first, what has actually been agreed? Well, calling it a trade deal at this point is somewhat premature. Johnson and Scott Morrison have instead agreed the broad terms of a trade deal, known as an agreement in principle. Anyway, the agreement in principle is set to eliminate tariffs on UK goods over a 15-year transition period, allowing both sides to slowly adapt to the changing trade environment. For instance, the blanket 12% tariff on beef products and quota of 3,761 tonnes, for instance, will, over the course of 15 years, be removed. For context, that 12% tariff currently amounts to an added cost of between £1.40 and £2.50 a kilo, depending on the cut of beef that's being imported. And when you're talking tonnes of meat, the pennies, or more precisely the pounds, add up. Assuming all the beef is of cheaper cuts, the tariffs amount to about £5.26 million, and if we assume more expensive cuts, that figure rises closer to £10 million. Going beyond beef though, and according to the British government, this deal will eliminate tariffs on Australian favourites like Jacobs Creek and Hardy Wines, swimwear and confectionery, boosting choice for British consumers and saving households up to £34 million a year. More broadly though, this deal is also widely seen as a key step on the UK's plan to join the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, the 11-member free trade area covering some $13 trillion worth of trade. But what's all the fuss about? Well, the agreement is, as we've mentioned already, the first post-Brexit agreement to be negotiated from scratch. All of the other agreements have simply been rollovers, or largely based on existing trade deals that the UK had through its membership of the European Union. The actual major controversy surrounding this agreement concerns its impact on farmers though. As musings of an agreement began to perk up last month, farmers began to worry about the implications of such an agreement. 
It was rumoured at the time, and now confirmed, that the UK has agreed to a 15-year transition period to tariff and quota-free access. Such frictionless access to the British market risks, in the eyes of farmers at least, the market being flooded with cheaper Australian beef, pushing down prices and in turn pushing British farmers out of business. Some 2.3 million tonnes of beef are produced annually in Australia, of which 61% or just over 1.4 million tonnes are exported globally. For context, the UK produces just 900,000 tonnes and exports far less. The Australian agriculture company, Australia's largest single exporter of beef back in May, predicted that if the UK was to grant Australia a zero-tariff, zero-quota deal, exports of Australian beef would increase up to tenfold. More broadly though, the worry isn't just whether or not Australian beef will flood the market, but what precedent such an agreement sets. As the UK's first post-Brexit deal negotiated from scratch, this agreement will forever be the default starting position for other countries wanting to reach an agreement with the UK. Therefore, concessions given to Australia will invariably be sought in future negotiations with the US, New Zealand, and so on and so forth. Something the current president of the National Farmers Union of Scotland has warned risks creating a snowball effect, as more and more countries gain tariff and quota free access, more and more downward pressure will be put on prices, and thus more and more farmers will be put out of business in Britain. A matter that's made yet worse when you remember that the US, Brazil and New Zealand are all huge meat producers, and on the Department for International Trade's radar. This concern for the farming community is not simply restricted to the farmers themselves. Animal rights activists are also worried about the implications of this deal. As this widely circulated RSPCA graphic shows, there's a vast difference between the animal welfare standards in the UK and Australia, and due to this deal, these products will soon be able to freely enter the UK. It's easy to say that people don't have to buy it, but it's not clear how these products will be labelled. And more than that, what about restaurants, cafes, cafeterias, etc? How could you possibly know where your meat has come from, let alone how it's been treated? Even beyond animal welfare issues, this disparity leads many farmers to worry about a race to the bottom when it comes to costs and standards in the industry. This all also comes as the subsidy given to farmers under the EU's common agricultural policy are being replaced by domestically allocated and determined subsidies. The chair of the Commons Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Select Committee wrote to Liz Truss, the International Trade Secretary, last month, calling for any agreements in principle to be published as soon as it's signed off to allow for scrutiny of potential implications for UK farmers, as well as calling on the government to clarify the details of the Trade and Agriculture Commission, which will play a vital role in the scrutiny of new free trade agreements. At the time of writing, the agreement in principle has not yet been published, with information set to be released in the coming days. Although the government's press release does stress that Parliament will have the opportunity to scrutinise the agreement in detail once the text is published, along with an impact assessment. There's also worry that the deal is somewhat one-sided. Modelling done by the UK's very own Department for International Trade back in July of 2020 laid out two scenarios, the more pessimistic scenario, which they creatively entitled Scenario 1, and a more optimistic one, Scenario 2. Under Scenario 1, the agreement will see UK exports to Australia jump by 3.6%, with UK imports from Australia increasing by 7.4%. Under Scenario 2, the UK's exports jump to 7.3%, but UK imports from Australia increase by 83.2%, a huge discrepancy. In any case, it's expected that the overall impact of the agreement on gross domestic product will be between 0.01 and 0.02% over the next 15 years. Which, it's worth saying, makes this deal relatively minor, at least currently. Comparing the trade the UK does with the EU versus with Australia shows the impact this deal is likely to have, and that's even more clear when we consider the total difference this deal is set to make economically. One other controversy raised, not about trade this time, was related to visas and backpackers. As you may or may not know, Australia is a pretty big destination for British backpackers, at least outside of the time of the pandemic. 
Rules currently mean that if a backpacker wants to extend their visa to a second year, they have to complete 88 days working on a farm. This benefits Australia as they get seasonal workers, and for some backpackers, this can add to the experience. However, there's been some criticism of the policy, with backpackers sometimes being exploited, both sexually and economically. And let's not forget that Australia's climate is harsh, especially for people from the UK who consider 20 degrees hot. So, as part of this deal, Australia has agreed to drop the 88-day rule. Therefore, there will likely be some people celebrating this rule drop. However, some Australians, especially farmers, may be frustrated about the decision, as it will likely exacerbate the shortage of farm labour, estimated at around 10,000 workers in the country. But what do you think? Is this the start of a new global Britain, or are farmers being put out to pasture? As always, let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we release a new video. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible. And if you want to see your name at the end of videos, then you too can back us on Patreon. The link to that is in the description.